Hello, everyone. You are listening to She Leads with Carly. And in this show, we talk to the absolute best, brightest, and yes, badass leaders. Together, let's build a DNA of what it takes to rise to the top and truly make an impact. I'm your host, Carly Malatsky. Hello, everyone. I am incredibly excited to welcome our guest today, Catherine Plummer. Kat is an American professional volleyball player who plays as an outside hitter for the United States Women's National Volleyball Team and the Italian club Imoco Volley. Prior to playing volleyball professionally, Kat played for the Stanford Women's Volleyball Team. She led Stanford to win NCAA Division I National Championships in 2016, 2018, and 2019. Three times, yes. Wow. She was named to the NCAA All-Tournament Team all three years and won the Most Outstanding Player Year Award in her two final seasons. As a freshman, she won National Freshman of the Year by the AVCA, and in 2017 and 2018, she earned the Pac-12 Player of the Year and National Player of the Year. Kat has also been a member of the U.S. Women's Volleyball Team since 2019 and is the only player in history to win the FIVB World Championship medals in both beach and indoor volleyball. Kat, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. Of course. So even before, Kat, reading this intro, (laughs) it's incredible. How does it, what feelings come up? How does it make you feel to hear that? I mean, it's cool to look back on everything that I've done so far in my volleyball career, but it also is a little bit like unnervy to hear people talk about me. (laughs) Um, But Yeah. yeah, I think just I've been playing since I was... 10. So there's a lot of years there to stack up. And I've obviously been able to have great experiences and a lot of success, but um, yeah. it's kind of fun to hear it all in the same like little intro, but exactly to me it all seem in like one that. place yeah. together. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So, first, before we even get into childhood and how you were as a kid, I want to set the scene for us. Where are you in the world? What does training look like now? What, what's going on? So, currently, I live in Huntington Beach, California. Um, the U S national team, we train in Anaheim, California. So it's about like a 25 minute drive from where I live now. Um, but I'm originally from Southern California, so it's really nice. My family is really close by. And then, so I'm here usually from middle of May until like middle of September. And then I'm in Italy, as you mentioned, from September until May. So it's, I have like two lives kind of. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. So Kat, what I love to do is go back to childhood cat five-year-old (laughs) ten-year-old like you said what type of kid were you like and even more so I guess what I've seen with athletes is there's a lot of energy and you have to expend that energy so what was what was it like for you definitely um growing up so I have an older brother he's five years older and so growing up I wanted to do everything that he was doing and both my parents were athletes in college and my dad was a professional athlete and so they were like like you said, we have to get these kids to expend this energy and also just to get them to stay active. Um, so my parents put us in every single sport imaginable. Like I was playing t-ball when I was four, I think, and then pretty much every other sport under the sun. I played basketball, soccer, um, t-ball, softball. I was a cheerleader in elementary school. So truly like any sport that you can imagine, they put me in. And I think that every sport like has helped me become has affected like my athletic career in some way uh, which is really nice and I may have heard from an external source that maybe baseball and softball weren't so Mm -hmm. fitting for you (laughs) those were fitting for me (laughs) tell me a little bit about those stories I hear that you know you struggle to maybe hold on to the bat and the umpires were quite fearful for their lives that's definitely but yeah that's accurate I was so granted I played softball and I was like eight so it's not going to be good in general like most girls are just kicking the sand playing in the outfield anyway but I could I could hit the ball really well but it was a matter of keeping control of the bat in my hands um so whenever I made contact (laughs) instead of gently resting it on the floor it usually ended up in the air um and so umpires were fearful whenever I stepped up to bat and softball didn't like me and I didn't like it back so we figured it out that it wasn't meant it worked for us. Out well. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, it seems like a very natural motion because you're hitting it. So you may as well just exactly. release it. That's what I thought so too. So I totally understand <laughs> that. And at this age too, were you, 
was an incredibly competitive household almost because, you know, parents are both athletes, professional athletes. Your brother is also an athlete. What was the um, environment like? Very much so. Um, we are just competitive natured people. Um, and whether that be in sports or like whoever could finish their dinner first, like it was always a competition in our house. Um, and like I said, my brother's five years older, so obviously he's bigger, taller, stronger than me in general, but, um, I wanted to beat him and everything. It didn't ever happen, but that was always my goal to like strive to beat him. And my parents kind of let it happen. Um, they wanted us to work things out, um, like get in the grunt of stuff just to figure it out by ourselves. Um, but yeah, definitely yeah. competitive household in everything that we did. Yeah. And you mentioned at 10 years old, is that the first time you started playing volleyball or yeah. even earlier? I started playing when I was 10, um, just because my brother played. And like I said, I wanted to do everything that he did. And we were at a club volleyball tournament for him and I was bored just sitting with my parents. And so I just picked up a volleyball and his club coach, like was trying to keep me entertained as well. There was like a little break and he's like, wait, you, you could actually be really good at this. And then I started clinics, um, at like a local club volley- volleyball club around here. And then I was like, wait, I really like this. So I dropped every other sport within a matter of a couple of weeks. And then volleyball was it from then on. Wow. Yes. I was, I was really curious about that of how long it took for you to be like, you know what? Volleyball is my sport yeah. and that's it. And and during this time too, at what point, because I I know you, I mean, in general, playing in college, you get recruited super early. Yeah. And it's even getting earlier, mm-hmm. unfortunately, yeah. I would say. But at what point for you did it become a reality that, you know what, I could actually play in college and maybe beyond? Yeah. Um. So I started when I was 10 and then I started like going to college camps and stuff just to in the summers to keep me entertained. Um, but then in the seventh grade was when I first got my like first college offer. Um, it was from Long Beach state. And so it's like close to home. So I was always around those people. Um, I knew the coaching staff really well. And then they offered me and I was like, that is too early. I have no idea what to say to you. Like I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, and like from my perspective, that's too early. Like, I what was I 12 or 13? I don't know what I want to do with the rest of my life. I don't I can't make that decision then. Um yeah. and like you said it's getting earlier and earlier people that I know that I played against in college, they committed in their 7th and 8th graders. Um and to me that's just absurd. And so I I mean could have done that, but yeah. like with discussions with my parents and just things that I wanted to do, I was like, I'm going to wait because I have no idea what I want to do in the next, let alone month. And I can't decide what I want my future to be like. And uh, so, yeah, I waited and other opportunities came up and then Stanford came and I was like, okay, I can't pass this opportunity up. Yeah. So, okay. Before even Stanford, touching on this notion where college coaches are talking to players at 12, 13 Mm -hmm. years old, you know, and deciding, you know, this is where you're going to spend your college years in the next seven years. How, who do you almost think is to blame in a way? Because is it parents who are pushing their kids too hard? Is it the coaches, you know, the college coaches, and it just gets earlier and earlier and there's pressure coming from either side. How do you really view the whole situation, all the different stakeholders? I mean, I don't, I think in some situations it's like, it can be different in every situation. For my situation, it wasn't my parents. They were the ones that were telling me like, granted, like we want you to have these opportunities and we want to put you like, help you be on the best teams if that's like the thing that you want to do. And we're going to make these sacrifices. But in by no means that they want me to commit to university when I was in the seventh grade. Um, and I don't even know if it's the coach's fault either, um, just because like opportunities for them come up too and they have to take advantage of that um, right. if they want to like build a team that they think would be successful and so like they think oh she's getting other offers from other schools like we have to do this now also yeah. um, I think now I think they have actually changed the rules so at least in volleyball they can't have you on campus like as a part of like a re- as a recruit until you're a junior in college in high school excuse me Um, which is really nice. And I don't know if that's the same for other sports, but at least in volleyball, like they can't talk to you on the phone until you're a junior in high school. 
um, yeah. which is, I think, the right time to talk to somebody. Um, granted, like high schoolers, freshmen and sophomores can have their ideas of what they want to do and where they want to go and go to the campuses. But I think doing it on your own is way different than like being a recruit and having these coaches show you around and show you all the bells and whistles of their campus and the team and everything. I think when they're a junior, I think that's the right time. Um, and I'm right. glad that that like transition has started. Um, so hopefully yeah. it, it's beneficial for all parties involved. Right. I think exactly. I think it's like once those rules are in place and at least some type of regulation, because the reason why coaches go so early is because other ones do. Exactly. So they have to just compete. Yeah. Like they're just doing their job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think soccer is fairly similar to that as of now. Yeah. Um, so throughout high school, eventually Stanford becomes an option. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, what type of student were you in high school? Was school exciting to you? Were you just like, you know what? Volleyball is my life. And I can understand that, right? Yeah. Soccer like becomes your whole identity. Yeah. So how were you as a, as a person in high school? I would say I was like the epitome of a student athlete and <laughs> nothing really else. Um, yeah. So volleyball like was my life. As soon as I was done with school, I would drive to practice um, and do my homework right after practice. But for a lot of my like high school years, I was driving up an hour and a half to go to beach practice right after school and then driving an hour and a half down to go to indoor practice and then doing my homework after that um, and then waking up the next day and doing the same thing over again. Um, but to me, like school was extremely important and I, like I said, didn't really do much else. Like spending time with friends, my friends were my volleyball teammates for the most part um, just because like there wasn't enough time in the day. Um, and I think that's kind of why Stanford became, they weren't always there. And then when they were there, I was like, okay, my efforts are really paying off. And like, they're seeing the things I'm doing outside of volleyball. Um, and I'm like, okay, like the sacrifices that I've made, honestly, it's not even a sacrifice. It was just a choice that I made um, right. to do it. And like the opportunities came up and I was like, okay, my hard work is paying off. So I might as well keep with it. Yeah. And what's fascinating. And I think, I think it is a commonality amongst top, top athletes, but mm. what seems to be relevant to you too, is it was very intrinsically motivated, exactly. right? It, yeah. come, it was coming from you. It doesn't seem like your parents were pushing no. you to say like, you're going to beach and then you're going to indoor yeah. and then you're going to study. Oh, yeah. Exactly. My parents, they never had any expectations of you're going to get straight A's. You're going to be on these top teams, nothing like that. It was all me. And like, I worked my butt off to get really good grades. I worked my butt off to be on these top teams. I figured out how I was going to get there. Like I carpooled with my teammates that were had to do the same thing, blah, 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 blah. So like I made it work. And obviously my parents were like an incredible support system. Um, and they still are, but like, yeah, definitely the motivation came a lot from me and they just, their expectation was that I work hard. And if the results came great, if not, at least you worked hard, you know, that was kind of, yeah. the, that was how our household was for the most part of my upbringing. I love that. And you end up going to Stanford. Like I said in the intro, right? You won three national mm -hmm. championships. You absolutely excelled. And even I'll give a very quick, you know, from my perspective, playing on the women's soccer mm -hmm. team at Stanford, we saw volleyball as like, <laughs> these are absolute badasses, <laughs> right? Like they are incredible, whether it's, you know, you, Jenna, Morgan, like you guys just had mm -hmm. an amazing class, an amazing team. Yeah. Just talk me a little bit through your experience and what do you think can you attribute that pure excellence to? Yeah, like you mentioned, Jenna and Morgan and Adriana and the Keefe twins were a part of my class. So we had six um, in a class yeah. and four of us started as freshmen and played out the rest of our four years. Um, and that's really rare in any sport, but especially college volleyball. Um, but yeah, I think going in there, we knew that we had a great class just because of like high school performances and club performances, but like the jump from club volleyball to college volleyball and then college to pro is like crazy. Um, the speed of the game in changes completely um, how they do different things. I mean, I'm sick. I'm sure it's the same for every sport, but um, like we never really felt any pressure my freshman year because we had no expectations. I think going right. into the tournament, we were seated like seventh or something. And that was like a shock. We're like, Oh my God, 
and we didn't even do that well in like our league. We just played really tough teams in the preseason. And so like that's helped our ranking. Um, but we were like, holy crap. And then we went to the tournament and upset um, someone on the road. Like we were down uh, two sets to zero. And then we came back and won in five sets. And it was like a miracle. And then right. from there, it was like, okay, this, like, no one's stopping this train. And so our freshman year, we won, but like, there was, it was like a surprise. Uh, yeah. And then my sophomore year, like, the expectation was super high. We got a new coaching staff. And then I think with that coaching staff, like, we were more hesitant to change the culture just because we're like, we won. So why would we change? Um, right. But I think the coaching staff that came in, um, had a lot on their shoulders because we had just won. And so like the expectation was there, unlike it was the year prior. And so it was tough for them. It was tough for us because we were like, okay, if we don't perform, then what's wrong, you know? And I think that's kind of what got us, got to us um, at the end of the year is that we kind of crumbled with the expectations um, and we weren't like the best team. We might have had like the best players, but we didn't play as a team. And so that – yeah. Is probably the reason that we lost. And then my junior and senior year, it was starting from the drawing board again. And junior year, we were like ranked number one throughout the whole year. We had only lost once. And then in the semifinal, we ended up getting to play the team that we had lost to. And we kicked their butts. So it was so nice. Um, and then we ended up <laughs> winning a really tough match against Nebraska, who were like crazy volleyball fans. The arena was completely sold out. I think it was like 17,000 people, which for a college volleyball game is like insane. Um, and then my senior year, it was way different. Uh, I got hurt. So I was out for half the year. And so there were really no expectations for me at least. And I didn't even know if I was going to be able to play at the end of the year. And I figured out my rehab. I figured out how to get better. And my team like played really well. I think they lost like one game in the Pac-12 without me. And then in the tournament, it was like a, we were just like a steam train. We just went and there was nobody stopping us. And it was great. So like every four years, there was a different expectation or like a different thing leading right. up to it. And so that kind of made it fun because you never knew what was going to happen. And yeah, I mean, yeah, we figured out ways to win and sometimes when we shouldn't have. So it was, it was really cool. I, so I can go in so many different <laughs> directions right now, but when you mentioned, and this may come up again, but when you mentioned that one game, right in Nebraska, mm -hmm. crazy fans, crazy environment, 17,000 fans, what do you do as an, as an athlete to really channel the mental side of the game to really maybe subside the nerves? Do you get nervous before? How do you, how do you deal with that? Do you listen to music before? What are your personal journey and tips for going into that type of environment? Yeah, for me, I mean, everybody will get nervous in that situation. Like you're going into an NCAA exactly. championship final and like that's like the biggest moment of your career thus far. Like it's you're like, holy crap. Um, but I think for me as a player in general and even as a person, I'm pretty like steady and like kind of calm, cool, collected. I don't get too high. I don't get too low. Um, and that's like how I play my best just because if I were to be like this, it just doesn't work for me. It may work for some players, but not for me. Um, and I, yeah. so I think for those situations, it's like, that's a great baseline for me um, is to just be more like this instead of like this. And so like when things are going great, great. When things are not going your way, I think uh, I remember in that game, like we beat them in the first set and it was close. They beat us in the second set. It was close. And then they kicked our butt like 25 to like 15 in the third set and we're like oh crap here we go yeah. and then the fourth set we did the same thing to them so like volleyball is a really big game of momentum mm -hmm. just like a lot of sports are but especially volleyball just because the points go by so fast um and so for me like staying calm throughout the warm-up the locker room the game everything and like having routines for all of that um, is just super critical uh, especially in those big moments yeah. And do you feel that that is something that's very natural to you? Did you have that from a young age or is that something you actually learned, whether it's talking to sports psych or parents or you just, yeah. How did, how did you learn to be like that? I mean, I think it's pretty natural. And in college, I didn't necessarily take advantage of like the resources, like a sports psych um, right. that I do now. Um, I think it's really helped me so far 
I've been working them for, with them for a short time, but I think I've been like seeing really cool results. But in college, like I just kind of did what I'd always done growing up and it was natural. Like I'm a very superstitious person. So that kind of goes with my routines. Like I had to wear the same hair tie, even though if it was like completely stretched out and actually didn't hair, hold my hair up, like I had to wear it <laughs> or I had to have the same coffee or uh, I remember like one our freshman year when we won the national championship, I had a hamburger before the game. And so every year after that, I had to have a hamburger before the national championship. And the year that we didn't win, I didn't have one. So I'm like, oh my gosh, that that must be it. That's why we didn't win. Um, <laughs> well, that's not even yeah. the case. But like, <laughs> I, I'm i like a superstitious person and that's come from my childhood. Like at club tournaments when my mom would do my hair a different way and we lost, I'm like, mom, what the heck? Like that was your fault. <laughs> it's your <laughs> it's fault, all on mom. you. Um, so like – it was like already inside of me, but I think I've now learned the tools where it's like I can repeat it over and over and not have these superstitions. It's like actually in my head of what I need to be doing. Um, and like right. there's results. It's very results driven instead of like superstitions, um, which I think is much better for me. But yeah, in college, I was like every and a lot of people on my team were like that as well like I know Morgan like had to do a certain thing like I had to have her braid my hair every day um yeah. and like she had different things that she had to do everyone was different um and I think that's what helped us like that's what made it work right and it just shows even the superstitions right it just shows the power of the mind yes it's just telling yourself you know <laughs> I did everything I was supposed to do I had a hamburger I have the right hair yeah. tie like everything's great I'm ready for yeah this it game, definitely you know? like makes you get you ready um, right. It's like kind of like a checklist, like you said. And yeah. once you have all these things, you're like, okay, I'm ready to go to battle. Um, but then yeah. on the flip side, like if you weren't able to get that, like that can screw you up, you know? Uh, For sure. And so like that's kind of where having more of like a baseline with things that are outside of your control is more practical. Yeah. And I'm curious, during Stanford or honestly throughout your career, have you ever struggled with almost conflating your performance on the court with your personal worth as a person and, you know, kind of balance it to it rather than separate, you know, cat as a person, as a, you mm -hmm. know, daughter, girlfriend, fiance, whatever it may be versus cat, the volleyball player. Has that really kind of meshed together at some point? Yeah, I think for a long time and I'm still working on it. Um, but I yeah. think I've done a better job of kind of separating my lives and like when I'm in the gym and when I'm, on the court like that's my life for now and then when I'm in my car on the way home like this is my other life and I'm still working on it it's like a work in progress but I think in college my life was very much like you are a volleyball player um and that was tough especially my sophomore year when I like I said there was all these expectations after winning and then we weren't like playing the best and so like the volleyball player who I was supposed to be like wasn't doing well so I was like oh the person isn't doing well you know um, sure. and I also think it was that I spent like every waking moment with my volleyball teammates. Like my freshman year, we were in the exact same classes. My sophomore year, we were in the exact same classes. And so for me, like finding an outlet that wasn't volleyball was crucial. And that's actually how I met my fiance is like, he was on the baseball team and I met all of his friends and like outside of the volleyball gym, I didn't really spend that much time with my teammates. And that was healthy for me. Um, right. And that separated like Catherine, the person from Catherine, the volleyball player. And like, I think I've become a better volleyball player and a better person because of that, um, because I'm like having these separate things. So like if I have a bad practice or a bad game, I don't bring it. I try well, sometimes <laughs> it's still like I said, so <laughs> I guess I try not to bring it outside because why would I let what happened for three hours affect the rest of my life? You know, definitely. And being at Stanford, Mind you, it's a top academic institution. Mm -hmm. So how was that experience of, you know, balancing, obviously, academics, volleyball? And yeah, how, how did you kind of balance that and navigate it? I think it was helpful in a sense that a lot of my teammates, like, were in the same classes. So I majored in human, human biology and, like, three out of the six in my class were in that major. Um, and so we, yeah. like, had a lot of the same things. We were doing all the same homework assignments excuse me and so that was nice to be able to like bounce ideas off of each other and I was also in a sorority and a lot of them were in my major as well and so like we would have Sunday night p set like quizzes and stuff um 
Right. And so that was nice. But I think it's kind of like intrinsic motivation once again. Like you just have to figure out how to get it done or else it won't get done. You know, like you might not be able to go to this party or you not might not be able to like go to get dinner with your friends when you have work to do. And in college, I think that gets harder than it did in high school, at least for me, like because there's so many other temptations. Like you want to spend time with your friends. You want to escape the volleyball aspect, blah, 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 blah. But like you need to get your work done as well. Um, and I think my sophomore year, it was super hard, especially because I was like in the core of my major, the hardest classes. And we were like struggling a little bit in volleyball and all this stuff was happening. And so like for me, school like became not the priority. <laughs> and my mom was like, Kat, you like need to figure – that was like the one time when she was like, you need to figure it out. Um, yeah. And thankfully she did because I figured it out. But I think like it was just – intrinsic motivation like I needed to get it done so it had to get done you know it wasn't really a, like a choice necessarily and looking back now at your Stanford experience overall what would you, is there anything you would have done differently or almost advice for someone who's going through that process now and all the challenges that we know can come up yeah it's funny enough I was actually talking to my fiance about this last night um because he's like um submitting applications for business school and all this stuff. And we were like, why would you choose Stanford? And like, why would you do it again if you had to? And I think I didn't take advantage of like everything outside of volleyball and outside of like my teammates. Like, so, you know, our freshman dorms, like you're paired with a non-athlete. I wish I would have taken advantage of that more and like spent time with the people in my dorm that weren't involved in athletics at all. Cause I was around athletes the majority of my four years there or like right. got involved with like, um, I don't even know what it's, it's like the community service outreaches that the Stanford Athletics Department puts on or like just get involved with everything that Stanford has to offer because there's so many resources and so much that like athletes don't take advantage of because we're like so focused on our sport or so focused on hanging out with our teammates or other athletes because that's like what's familiar to us. And so I would say like getting out of your comfort zone and putting yourself in spaces that like might feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's so easy to just get so wrapped in that bubble. <laughs> Definitely. It's so easy. And then it's it's very much an intentional, I am going to yes. explore other things. Yes. You know, it doesn't just come necessarily. Yes, so sure. I, I love that piece. And during this time, was it very obvious that you were going to continue playing pro? And how did you almost navigate the next the next step, the next stage of your life, if you will, from going from college to now pro? I think in college – when I had a lot of success, like at that level, I was like, okay, maybe I can do this. Like as like a young athlete, even before college, I was like, oh, that's the dream. You know, like my dream is to be on the national team. My dream is to go to the Olympics. My dream is to be a professional volleyball player. But you're like, okay, am I good enough? I don't know. But when you like start playing up against these people that like are going to do that and you're beating them and you're like, okay, maybe I am good enough. Um, then that like becomes a reality. So I think my like sophomore year, was when I really started to like look into it and our coach Kevin Hambly played professional volleyball and is like has relationships with these people and so like that was a great resource to for for me to ask questions um just to get a better understanding of like what that might be like if that was the route I wanted to take um yeah. and then that continued all throughout until my senior year. And so when I started thinking about it, I was like, okay, if I want to go, is the best option to graduate early or maybe try to do it the next year. So I ended up graduating Stanford early. I finished in December um, and then went overseas right after my senior year in January. Um, and so like that was my decision and that wasn't forced upon me at all. Um, and the opportunities came up just because I had a successful career in college. And so I was like, why wouldn't I why would I pass up this opportunity if I can do it? And that's been my dream for a long time. So it's kind of where yeah. it started and then it's blossomed from there. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get to that. Yeah. But for walk me through, you couldn't actually play professionally in the US from my understanding, no. right? There's no, there wasn't, and there isn't a league until the near future. But back then, you know, the only option was to go play professionally. So how were you navigating internationally? So how are you navigating you know, where to go play internationally. Mm -hmm. And also 
mind you, like, did you have fears, you know, going across the world to a, a foreign country? Yeah, I mean, like you said, there's no league as of yet. There start one starts next January 2024. Um, but when I was deciding to be professional, there was no option to be in the U.S. And so my thought process was always like, I want to go to the country that has like the best league or the best clubs that I know of um, and that are also interested in me. So like, obviously like if I'm interested in them, like they also have to be interested in me, you know, it's not just a one way street. Um, And so the top leagues in Europe are um, Italy and Turkey. And so like, that was always what I wanted to do. And so my senior year, I like found an agent who was Italian um, and like we had multiple discussions and then like he came to the final four and we talked about it. Um, and I ended up signing a contract like a week later, but obviously like before you do it, like you're like, okay, this is going to be really easy. Like I had done like junior national stuff and I had traveled to all these countries playing volleyball. But what I like neglected to realize was that when I was doing that, I was with all Americans, everybody that spoke my language. Um, I was just in a very comfortable place. And then when you yeah. are, next thing you know, you're flying across the world to Milan, you get off the airplane and you know absolutely no one. You don't know the language that they're speaking. You don't even know who's picking you up from the airport. Um, like you don't know what they look like. You don't know what's happening. Um, you have too many suitcases, so they don't even fit in the car. One of your suitcases doesn't get there and has all of your volleyball stuff in it. You're like, okay, this is a different world that I like wasn't prepared for. And yeah. my first year was really tough. Uh, being overseas by myself and it also wasn't helpful that the first year that I was overseas was when COVID started and I was in Italy like 20 minutes from where like the outbreak started in in Italy where it was the worst and so like that drastically changed my experience as well Um, but even before that like I was not having a good time like it was not what I was used to in terms of like how I want to feel when I'm playing volleyball um just because it's and what and what aspects were I mean obviously like you mentioned there were so many different things but was it was it the team was it being away from family you know what aspects made it so challenging did you ever think maybe I need to go back yeah um I think it's kind of everything obviously being away from family and being away from my boyfriend at the time was really hard um yeah. thank god for FaceTime or like I would not have survived but also like like I mentioned pre- previously, like the jump from high school to college is huge, but then the jump from college to pro, like you can't even imagine it. And so like I'm coming off being the best player in college, blah, 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 blah. And then you go there and like you're a schmuck. Like they're like, I don't really know what you've done. I don't know anything that you've done. Um, you're probably like not really going to play for right now. And then I ended up starting like a couple, like a week later, but like, from being like the go-to girl to not even seeing the floor um, and like not being able to understand anybody and then like coming in half the season and trying to beat these people out that have been there for the whole year. Like that was also challenging because then my teammates didn't really like me and I was like, okay, this can't really go worse. So you might as well like just try to figure it out um, and like just keep grinding even though like you feel like you're kind of in the mud. Um, and I'm not saying that COVID was a good thing at all, but I think like it helped me like shift my perspective in like what's important. And if I'm going to go back overseas, like what am I going to get out of it? And how am I going to like take advantage of the opportunities that are given to me? And so the next year I went to Japan and like had a completely different experience just because I knew like what it looked like and I knew like what I had to do and like what I had to ask of the team for me. And so it was like a balancing act of, okay, I'm actually a professional now and I know what I need to ask for um, in order to like make my life comfortable because I'm in a place that's not my home, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And going back to that at first Italian club and like you mentioned, right, it's you're going from the best to now having to prove yourself and teammates don't like you because you're stealing their mm-hmm. starting spot and all the different aspects that come into it. This, what it seems like is also the first moment where maybe you didn't have that confidence mm-hmm. or, you know, Stanford, like things were going really smooth and really exciting and things were good. 
How did you, like from a day-to-day perspective, how did you deal with that? How did, what tips or, you know, things that, that you did that really helped you kind of get out of the mud, like you said? Yeah, I think I would completely agree with you. Like my first year overseas, my confidence was completely depleted just because everything was unfamiliar and like volleyball no longer felt fun. So I was like, why am I here? And like, if, okay, I might be performing well in volleyball, but in that moment when everything else around me sucked, I was now Catherine, the volleyball player only and didn't have Catherine, the person anymore. Um, And so I think like getting through the mud, I don't know if I did really until like I got to come home from COVID and like got that reset because it was the middle of February when COVID started. And I was like, I can't get home soon enough. (laughs) And I got there like a month before I was in, in Italy two months to the day until I left. And it felt like the longest two months of my life. Um, But I think like getting that back just came from like kind of filling my cup up again with my family. And I got to train with the national team a little bit, like very limited because of COVID. But I think like just being around people that I'm familiar with, with, that I'm comfortable with um, allowed me to be like, okay, I belong in this, in these settings. And like these people that I'm training with in the summer with the national team, like I felt like I belonged with the national team players because like I was competing with them and I was doing a really good job. And to me, like those players were like the big dogs and they had the biggest contracts and they were getting the most money and playing on the best teams. And so I was like, okay, if I can do this now and I can do that in college, like maybe the first year was like a little hitch and just forget about it and continue moving forward. And that's kind of what I tried to do. Wow. Right. And just like growing pains in a way, like it's a new chapter. It's naturally natural to be kind of hard. And so you went to Japan. Now, as I said, you, you're back in Italy. So Mm -hmm. from, you know, from an outsider, it could be, you know, like, Kat, what what are you doing? Why would you go back to Italy? But what, what was going through your mind to say, you know what, I, I need to go play for Imoko. Yeah. So the decision to go to Japan was kind of twofold. I wanted a different look from Italy because I just, didn't like it and I don't know if it was necessarily like my Italian team I think it was just like you said the growing pains of being away and not having anything be familiar um so I went a complete 180 and went to Japan um but um I think going from Japan I was like okay the league is good but it's not the greatest and I want to prepare myself to make a run at the Olympics someday and so I knew I needed to put myself in a situation that was going to do that. And Emoco is the best team in Italy. Um, we've won the last seven, I think, six or seven Italian championships. Um, and the year I got there, they won Champions League. And so, like, if that team wanted me and I wanted to play at a high level, like, why give up that opportunity? So I ended up signing a two-year contract with them. Um, and that was scary because I was like, my last Italian experience was not good. And I don't know if I should commit to two years of this because what if it's the same? Um, but ended up being the complete opposite. Like I had grown as a person, as a player. Um, I knew like what the pro life looked like. Obviously it's still hard being away from your family and friends for so long. Um, but because they've had so much success, they're also like super professional, um, and how they run things, how like the organization is run. And so for me, that was a comfort. Um, and the girls are great. Like our team language is English. And so that kind of took away like the language barrier. Um, obviously there's still a language barrier because if you're Italian and you're going to talk to Italians, you're going to speak in Italian, you know? And so sometimes like you don't know, um, but I'm picking up the language. So that's nice. And then I'm going back to the team um, this coming up season, like you said, and, I am just super excited because like the level is so high, but the girls are great and the organization is great. And like, I want to surround myself with people like that. And yeah, I'm just really excited. Yeah. That's amazing. And you mentioned briefly about the Olympics, Mm -hmm. right? And take me through that process when you found out that you got selected as an alternate for the 2021 Olympics. Mm -hmm. 
Cause that's a whole mental, you know, hard <laughs> mental game to play. Yeah. How did you deal with that? Yeah. I mean, I think coming out of college, like the Olympics was probably not going to happen for me when it was still in 2020. Um, so okay. I was like, okay, that's probably maybe too close of a turnaround. I don't think I can do that. Um, but I'll try. And then COVID happened and it got moved back a year. So I was like, okay, maybe there's more of a chance. Um, and like I went to Japan for a lot of reasons, like I mentioned, but also like they're really good at one skill that like I need to get better at and improve at. And so I was like, okay, I'll go there and get better at this skill. And I think I did. And I came into the national team in the summer of 2021, right before the Olympics. And I was playing really well. And we have a tournament called Volleyball Nations League. And so like we were in Italy for five weeks for that because it was like a like a bubble situation. So we were there for the whole time. And while we were there, they selected the Olympic roster. So there was 18 girls there and they selected 12. And so they announced the roster and granted, like, I didn't know, I didn't think I was going to be on the team just because of the people that were ahead of me and that had been there for 10 years. Um, Right. And so like the expectation was low, but like hearing your name as an alternate is still pretty crappy. Um, just because like you've worked your butt off and you're like, okay, like I want to be there and they don't really want me there, you know? Right. Um, and so that was tough and it was especially tough because they announced the raw, the Olympic roster when we still had about like two weeks left of the tournament. And so we were there for two weeks and we were training with the people that got selected for the Olympic roster. And so like you still have to be friends with everybody. You still have to be like cordial with everybody and like hang out and do all these things and practice and watch them play and blah, 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 blah. And so like that was challenging. Um, I think it was maybe less challenging just because I was like the youngest on the team and like didn't really have like that many expectations to make the team, but like still like not hearing your name called and not being chosen for something that you dreamed of still sucks. Um, but I think like that experience was great to like feel it but then also like have it kind of fuel you because obviously you don't want that feeling again come next next summer you're right so um yeah and now as you know 2024 olympics are coming up and obviously you're you're aiming to make that roster Mm -hmm. what goes into that from a you know having that previous experience fuel you what does that look like for you in in order to maintain this calm, collective, you know, pers- persona, if you will, but also being like, you know what, I I want to make this roster. Like, what does that look like for you? Whether it's goal setting, how, how do you kind of plan plan for that? Yeah, I mean, I think it is goal setting, but it's also literally like taking it day by day because some days yeah. you're going to have a great practice and some days you're not going to play really well. Um, and what's crappy is that every single day matters. Um especially like in the national team gym, like every time you touch the ball, it is statted and recorded and compared against your teammates. So you also have to like have relationships with and be cordial and be a great teammate. Um, And so it's game planning, but also I'm working with our sports psychologist in like having these huge like outcome goals and then having goals that like you could literally make a goal, like walk into the gym with your head held high every day, like no matter what, or like, how are you going to speak to yourself on in this certain situation or all of these things like add up to this big, very like outcome goal. Um, but like, what are the little results goals that you can make that can affect you like on the day to day? And I think that's been super beneficial for me. Um, and just like navigating, the environment of the national team because it's just so different than like anything you've ever experienced. Wow. I love that. And I think that's so valuable. And I'm so happy you said that even those very incremental, you know, Mm self-talk and daily things that you can, because again, like we're habitual beings, you know, Mm -hmm. you just get into that habit, which is amazing. And Kat, before we go on to, you know, more fun questions, if you will, (laughs) I'm really curious how you think of, you know, your career, 
beyond volleyball or if you've allowed mm-hmm. yourself to you know think about that how has that changed through the years now that you know you're about to be married yeah. and all, all these different things that come up how are you thinking through that I mean when I first started when I was in college like I thought I was going to play for 10 plus years have like the best yeah. career I remember our coach like when I got hurt my senior year, our coach Kevin Hambly was like, she's going to take rest because like she needs to focus on her professional career, which is going to be like 15 plus years. And I was like, whoa, that was not a plan for me. But I mean, <laughs> my plan was maybe like 10. And now that I am getting married, like you mentioned, next year, and I've like played at the top level for this for a long time and like I've seen the big moments that I want to see, I think – Obviously, like, my next goal is to go to the Olympics. And then after that, I don't really know, you know. Um, And I think that's kind of freeing in a way. Um, I think probably after this coming up season, I'll play at least one more overseas and then potentially play in one of the U.S. leagues that are coming up, potentially start in the corporate world. I mean, I have a degree from Stanford. um, and Casual. I I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but, like, Maybe I'll do that. I'm also getting my master's online right now, um, like while I'm overseas. So I'm trying to set myself up for when I make that decision, like there will be opportunities. Um, But like I said, I don't know when that decision will be made. And there's other factors like my fiance in, I mean, he's going to be my husband next year when he starts business school. Like, what does that look like for our life? Um, Like, when do we want to start having children? Like, as a female athlete, like, that's something that we have to talk about. Like, do you want to have kids and still play? Or do you want to be done after you have kids? Like, all those things, like, when you're a sophomore in college, you don't think about. And so you're like, okay, yeah, like, the dream is to play 10 years. And then when you're in it and, like, you're – I'm not even 25. I'm a grown-up. But, like, when you're, like, growing up and you're like, oh – there's so many other things in life that there are to offer and maybe like it's okay to like hang up your boots, you know, and do something outside of volleyball because I think that's exciting. Like, I don't know what that life is like because I've done volleyball for so long, but I think it's exciting to be like, I have all these opportunities and I could use what I've learned in volleyball, like in the rest of my life, you know? So yeah, that's exciting. Definitely. And big shout out, shout out to Mike, right? <laughs> Making this happen. And also, I mean, regardless of Olympics or not, like next year is going to be amazing because you be guys are fun. getting married. Yes. So that's great. <laughs> yes. So Kat, over, as you know, as we've discussed, like you have played on winning teams mm-hmm. and you it, like, that's just been a part of you from a young age. What do you think is almost a secret sauce that you have noticed across the board for these winning teams? Oh, Um, I think in order to be like a winning team, everybody on that team has to accept the role in which like they are given, um, whether that be like, you're going to be a starter or you're going to be a bench player or like you're going to go in and serve a ball or like, you're not going to see the court. Like you accept it and you like wholeheartedly commit to that role. Um, I think just in my experience, like those have been the teams that have had the most success. And like, I think the times that I've won the most, that's been the, the circumstance. Like, so for example, in college, me, Jenna Morgan, Adriana, like we all kind of knew our role. Like I was kind of like the lead by example, didn't really talk much. Morgan was like the fiery leader. Jenna was like the person that could crack a joke. Fitz was like the very analytical one. Um, and, and then like everybody on the, else on the court, like knew what role they kind of had to squeeze in. And then people that never played, like there are girls that didn't touch the floor for four years. And like, they were cool with, I don't know if they were cool with that, but they made it look like they were cool with that, you know, because they wholeheartedly accepted, like, this is like a team unit and like, this is just what has to be done. And the same thing has been seen on like my professional team in Italy, like, people like you kind of know who the starters are going to be but like if someone's not playing well like there's people that are completely ready on the bench to step in and like fill that role or on the national team same thing like we call them we call the bench players like the game changers um because like at any moment they can come in and like provide a spark that changes the game you know so I think 
for me in my experience, like to have a successful team and to have a winning team, like everybody has to be committed to like the role that they are given. So do you think that stems from the coach? Like, does the coach play a role in that or is it very much just from an intrinsic or at least a team player's perspective? I think it depends. Um, yeah. But I think in my situations, it's generally been like very intrinsic. Like you kind of see the writing on the wall, like you might not play. Um, and like, how can I help the team in this way? Or right. like, you know that you're going to play every single game. So like, what do I have to do to like maintain like a high level? You know, and like the coaches, yeah, like in practice, you might kind of see like what they're thinking or like what the lineups and the practices are like. So you're like, okay, this is what's going to happen. Um, but I think it's like very intrinsic in that, like for me as like a lead by example person, like that's not anything unnatural to me. Like that's just like what I do. And then people like have other rules that they fill in and it just works you know um, yeah. so I think just like finding ways for everybody on the court and everybody off the court to like make their presence known in order to like affect how the outcome is yeah definitely okay Kat question for you <laughs> <laughs> what is your most contrarian yet high conviction opinion oh gosh <laughs> What have other people said? I don't even know. Your, your hottest take, if you will. And you could take this any direction. On the one hand, I've got in, you know, espresso martinis are good in the morning. And, and you know, there's That is a hot take. <laughs> that is a hot take. Exactly. So you can really take it any direction. Hmm. Let's see. Okay. I think my hot take will be... I don't even know if this is like that weird, but like <laughs> uh, ketchup on eggs is like the best thing ever. Okay, there we go. I think that's pretty. I don't know. I've seen normal. that for sure. But I don't, espresso martinis in the morning. I've never heard that one. <laughs> that's a hot take. <laughs> that's uh, a hot take. I, think I don't even know. Okay. Well, if another one comes, okay. let me know. Is there a book or... I'll say book that you've read that you think everyone needs to read or that it like fundamentally changed your outlook on something. Okay. I used to not be a reader at all. And then two years ago overseas, my American teammate like changed my life with like reading. Um, and wow. the book that I read that like really got me back into reading was the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo. Great. one. Um, yeah. I don't even know if it's like, there's like such a huge message, but like, just being able to see someone's fictional life and like how many things are like hidden from the public um, as like a person that's in the public eye. I think that's really cool because I'm not saying like I'm in the public eye, but like I've had situations like in volleyball, in the volleyball world where like there's things that I don't want to be shared. And that was kind of cool to see her do that i also really love song of achilles the song of achilles have you read that book i haven't but it's on my list Very i good. know exactly what you Very good. so if you like seven husbands i don't know if you've read other taylor jenkins read, but have. she's amazing i have i love all them. really good yeah okay. what's the other I book that. i just finished it it's it's like really i have a i'm looking at my phone because i have a list of books that i've read i oh, love that i think we have similar tastes so this is great um let's see but there's been malibu rising daisy jones and the six daisy jones and the six have you watched the show i'm like i think the book is better i do too Maybe but i don't think they did like that bad of a job like yeah that. i'm like in the middle of it what is it called it's called oh i just read it it's called a little life um it's by i don't know if i, I don't even that. i think i'm gonna butcher her name her name's hanya Yanagiria, <laughs> I don't know, um, but it's like the most. It's very it's, touch. It's heavy. It's right? very heavy. Yes. Yeah. Um, right. And like you will read I it, and like your either. jaw will be dropped. Yeah. And but like it was a a great book, uh, and it's wow. like a really okay. long read, but it went by really fast. Wow. Okay. Good to know. Okay, Kat, what is your superpower? Oh, goodness. One <laughs> that I actually have or one that I wish I had? 
No, one that you have. You think like this is something that is very special to you that you can that you do really well at. Um, I think that I am really good at like embracing people where they are. Um, whether that. that be like if they're from a different culture or like if they're having a tough time in their life or whatever it may be, I think I'm good at and I'm still working at like just embracing people into my life no matter where they're at in their life yeah and I think that really comes with being a team player playing internationally all of that that's amazing okay Kat this has been so much fun thank Thank you you for joining the show I've loved it thank you so much Carly it was great to talk to a familiar face um, from our Stanford days so great to catch up yes amazing all right I wish you luck for this next year for beyond I know that without a doubt you are going to absolutely kill it in anything that you do so it's been so great thanks Thanks, hello everyone you are listening to she leads with Carly and in this show we talk to the absolute best brightest and yes badass leaders together let's build a DNA of what it takes to rise to the top and truly make an impact I'm your host, Carly Malatsky.